In the last video, we noted that there are two ways to deal with the maximum margin hyperplane objective. The second of these is to express everything in terms of the support vectors and to get rid of the actual parameters of the hyperplane. Unlike the first option, this requires us to keep the constraints of the problem, so we need to look beyond plane gradient descent at constrained optimization. We'll look at one form of constraint optimization in this video, the use of Lagrange multipliers, and then in the next video, we'll return to our maximum margin hyperplane objective and see what this second option looks like. First, let's make it a little bit more intuitive what optimization under constraints looks like. Here we have a relatively simple constrained optimization problem. We have a function of two variables x and y, for which we want to find a minimal point, and we have a constraint. In this case, the constraint specifies that the solution must lie on the unit circle. That is, x and y together must make a unit vector. We've illustrated this unit circle here in green. And among the set of x's and y's that together lie on this circle, we want to find the value that gives us the lowest point for this objective function f. If we draw this function f and we project this circle onto it, we see which part of this surface the constraint allows us to occupy. In short, we need to find the lowest point on this second green circle. One way to help us visualize this problem is to draw ISO lines, also known as contours, for the function f. These are the curves that indicate where the function is equal to some constant value. If we then rotate the camera so that it looks down onto the xy plane, we get a two-dimensional plot of our function where the contour lines give us an idea of the height of the function. This principle is also used often in maps to indicate elevation. Let's look at what these contour lines can tell us about the solution to our problem. Note here that the function f gets lower towards the bottom left corner. Now each contour line indicates a constant output value for our function, and that's the value that we want to minimize. So we can tell by this plot what we can achieve. Let's start with the value k1. Under our constraints, can we get the function f to evaluate to the value k1? It's very low. It's the lowest of the contour lines in this plot, so it would make a very good solution but it never meets this green circle that represents our constraints. And that means we cannot get the output as low as k and satisfy the constraints. The next lowest output value is k2, and this does give us a contour line that crosses the circle representing our constraints. That means there are two points indicated here that satisfy the constraints and give us an output value of k2. However, the fact that it crosses this circle means that we can also get lower than k2. So if our output is k2, we are not at the optimum. Why is that? To understand, we can look at what we know already about hyperplanes. We know that if we have a hyperplane defined by the equation w times x plus b, then we know that w is the direction of steepest descent, and minus w is the direction of steepest descent. This tells us that the direction orthogonal to the line of w is the direction in which the value of the plane doesn't change, the direction of equal value. This means that if we take any point on a contour line, we work out the tangent hyperplane of f, the function in red, at that point, that is, we compute the gradient, then the direction orthogonal to the gradient points along the contour line, because the contour line is the direction of equal value. And if we zoom in close enough, that is approximated well by this hyperplane. So locally, the direction of equal value is orthogonal to the gradient. Now looking at these arrows, we can see that because our contour line crosses the circle of the constraints, the direction of equal value doesn't point along the circle for the constraints. And we can conclude that moving along the circle from this point is not moving in the direction of equal value, so we'll change the value of f. In one direction it moves up, and in one direction it moves down. So to summarize, because this contour line crosses the green circle, we can improve on the function output by f on these two points. What we're looking for is a contour line for which the direction of equal value, orthogonal to the gradient of f, points along the circle. Because that means that if we take a small step in either direction along the circle, we are moving in the direction of equal value. 
And this happens when the contour line is tangent to the circle, when it touches it only at one point without crossing it. So how do we work out where this point is? Firstly, by recognizing that the circle for our constraints is also a contour line, not of our function f, but of the function x squared plus y squared for the constant value 1. This means that when we take the gradient of this function x squared plus y squared, and we look at the point where it points in the same direction or in the opposite direction of that of f, their contour lines will be tangent, because the directions of equal value will then also point in the same direction or in the opposite direction. So when this happens, we have a minimum or a maximum for our objective. So to summarize, if we rewrite our function to take this form, we have some function f whose output we want to minimize under the constraint that some other function g is equal to zero, then we can use this principle to find our solution. The contour lines of f and g are tangent where the gradients of f and g point along the same line. We can formalize this principle as follows. Note that we are looking for gradients pointing in the same or the opposite direction, but not necessarily gradients of the same size. So to state this formally, we say that there must be some alpha such that the gradient of f is equal to the gradient of g times alpha. We can rewrite this to something that must be equal to zero. And we can then move the gradient symbol out in front. This is essentially the opposite of what we usually do when we're working out a gradient or a derivative. And this tells us that what we're looking for is the point where the gradient of some function combining f and g is equal to zero. This new function we will call l, and it is a function of x and alpha. And with that, we've turned our constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained one. The price we pay is that we have one additional parameter alpha to optimize. So this is the idea of Lagrange multipliers. We rewrite our problem so that the constraints are some function that needs to be equal to zero. We create a new function L, which consists of f minus alpha times the constraint function. We take its gradient and we set that equal to zero and solve for x and alpha. Now it's important to note that the point where L equals zero is a saddle point. It's a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the other. This means that we cannot solve it by basic gradient descent because it's not a pure minimum. We have to set its gradient equal to zero and solve analytically. This method works for equality constraints, situations where our constraint function needs to be equal to some value, in this case zero. But in many other problems, like the one we saw in the previous video, we have an inequality constraint. Here is an example. Here, instead of saying that our solution needs to lie on the green circle, we state that our solution can lie anywhere outside the green circle, which leaves us this red surface on which we want to find a minimum. Inequality constraints can be active and inactive. In this case, the constraint is inactive. If we remove the constraint, it doesn't change the minimum that we would find. So any solution to this problem is also a solution to the unconstrained problem. If we change the direction of the inequality in this case, we say that we allow any solution that is inside the circle, we get an active constraint. The constraint stops us from going where we want to go, and we end up on the boundary of this circle, just like we did when the constraint was an equality constraint. To solve these problems, we first set the convention that all constraints are rewritten to be greater than equalities, with zero on the right-hand side. This can be done with a little bit of rewriting. This doesn't change the region we're constrained to, but note that the function on the left of the inequality sign had a bowl shape before and now has a hill shape. In other words, the gradients of this function now point in the opposite direction. So with this convention in place, there is one final thing that we need to keep in mind compared to the situation we saw before for the equality constraints. If we are minimizing, we need to make sure that the gradient of f points into the constrained region so that the direction of steepest descent which we want to follow, points outside. If the direction of steepest descent pointed into the region, we could find a lower point somewhere inside, away from the boundary. Since the gradient for the constraint points inside the region, we need to make sure that the two gradients, the one for the constraint function and the one for the objective function, point in the same direction. 
if we were maximizing, the situation would be reversed. And we would need to make sure that the two gradients point in opposite directions. We can formalize this requirement for a minimization objective like this. As before, we set the gradient of f equal to some alpha times the gradient of g. But this time, it's crucial that alpha is positive, so that the gradient of g and the gradient of f point in the same direction. We work out L as before, but now we don't end up with an unconstrained problem. We've simply traded one constrained problem for another. This new problem is sometimes called the Lagrangian dual of the original problem. A dual is a mathematical term for a different way of phrasing something. Even though we've not removed the constraint, we have simplified it a lot. It's now a linear function, even a constant one, stating only that alpha should be larger than zero. Linear constraints are much easier to handle, for instance, using methods like linear programming or gradient descent with projection. The price we've paid for this easier problem is an extra variable. Here, then, is the method of KKT multipliers. It's just like the Lagrangian method, but with two points we need to keep in mind. For a greater than zero inequality and a minimization problem, we must make sure to subtract the constrained term from the objective function. If we maximize instead of minimize, we add the term. And the resultant problem has one constraint, which is that the KKT multiplier alpha must be positive. So with this new formulation in terms of Lagrange multipliers or KKT multipliers, what can we do? If possible, we can solve the constrained optimization problem analytically, but we can also be content simply to rewrite our constrained optimization problem into a different problem. This new problem may teach us something interesting or be easier to solve using the methods that we have available. If we have multiple constraints, then we can simply repeat the process and every constraint adds one term to L with one additional Lagrange or KKT multiplier. And finally, it's important to remember plain gradient descent will not help us find the point where the gradient of L is equal to zero. Some methods do exist for this, but we won't go into them in this course. In the final video of this lecture, we will take what we've learned in this video and apply it to the soft margin objective function.